So we have metals, something called the covalent network, ionic compounds, and then we do actually have some molecular compounds made up of um, all non-metals besides this that are solids. So the type of bonding that is occurring here in each of these solids really dictate the properties of how these things are going to behave, what their characteristics are. And we can go the other direction too. We can have a solid and uh, explore some properties about it and then based on the properties we can figure out which kind of bonding um, is holding that phase of matter together. Okay, so let's start with metals. Metals are very familiar to us. Um, metals are held together by metallic bonding. And just to remind you that we think of metals as being these kernels or core of nucleus and core electrons and then surrounding those is this sea of delocalized electrons. So positively charged nucleus, the core electrons around that, so that's the individual atom of the metal. And then that is totally surrounded by a C, S-E-A, a C of delocalized mobile electrons. Okay, so delocalized mobile electrons. Valence electrons, valence electrons. And this force of attraction must be pretty darn tight. Must be pretty strong. Because metals are solid at room temperature. We have one exception to that. But otherwise, they're solids at room temperature. They're not liquids, except for mercury, and they're not gases. So this metallic bonding that consists of sharing these delocalized mobile, I'm going to write it, valence electrons is a really strong force of attraction holding one metal atom to another metal atom. Okay, and this gives metals some characteristics. So number one, they conduct electricity and heat very, very well because they are mobile valence electrons. Okay, so things are able to move. And so that's going to, number one, of course, conduct electricity because electricity is a flow of electrons. And so these mobile delocalized electrons can move if you apply uh, voltage to it, they can get pushed. But as well, heat because they're able to, because they're able to move and they can move fast, right, we can transfer kinetic energy very rapidly and efficiently. They're shiny, they're malleable and they're ductile. Malleable means we can pound them and they won't break. It's the opposite of brittle. And they're ductile, meaning that we can stretch them without them breaking as well. And that all comes from these properties of these mobile delocalized valence electrons. We can smash a metal and all that's going to do is it's just going to kind of spread out those atoms and spread out the sea of electrons, but it's not going to break anything. So it makes metals malleable and ductile. Okay, so at room temperature, 
we are very familiar with metals being solid. They have relatively high melting points. A little bit more about metals. A mixture of metal zip is called an alloy. So metals mix together very well with each other. Um, and a mixture is called an alloy, and there's a couple of different kinds of alloys. The first kind of alloy um, is an interstitial alloy. And in an interstitial alloy, smaller atoms fill in the spaces in between the larger metal atoms. So an example of an interstitial alloy is steel. So iron are the big, are the big atoms, and then in between the iron atoms, carbon atoms will place themselves. Now, of course, to make this alloy, you've got to liquefy the iron to, to get the carbon in there. Um, so you've got to melt it. But the carbon in between the iron atoms actually gives steel a more rigid lattice work. So um, it's stronger, but um, the opposite of that is that it, it loses some of its ductility and its malleability as well. So not so easy to flatten it or stretch it into thin wire. Um, but can it, can it still conduct heat and electricity? Yes, it can, because it still has this sea of mobile, delocalized valence electrons. Okay, the other kind of alloy is a substitutional. We actually made a substitutional alloy early in the year. So this is an alloy that is um, atoms of similar radius. And substitutional alloys remain malleable and ductile. Uh, brass is what we made. That is an example of a substitutional alloy. So we've got copper mixed with zinc. So not only does it keep its heat and conducting properties, but it also stays malleable and ductile. The next kind of solid I want to talk about is covalent network solid. So, covalent network. Covalent means that this network is sharing electrons. Okay, now this isn't uh, a sea of electrons where valence electrons can just go any old place they want to go. This is actual covalent bonding, where neighboring adjacent atoms are sharing a pair of electrons. These have extremely high melting points. They're very, very hard. And they are thermal insulators in that the heat doesn't transfer within them very well because nothing is really able to move. It can kind of vibrate in, in, in its spot, but this network, this lattice, is, saw, is, uh, is fixed in place. Some of them, though, actually do conduct electricity. So there's got to be some flow of electrons going on. Okay. So what are some examples of covalent networks? Well, the three most common examples are that we will, um, you'll encounter are two forms Two of the three naturally occurring allotropes of carbon. So naturally occurring elemental carbon. One of them being graphite, one of them being diamond, and the other one being a fullerene. So carbon 60, a buckyball. So that's a, a, a spherical, like a geodesic geo, dome. Um, and Quartz, 
SiO2, silicon dioxide. Sand is basically quartz. Glass is pretty much pure quartz. Okay, so these things are very familiar to us as being solids at room temperature as well. Um, this is graphite right here. This is a side view of graphite, and I'm going to talk a lot more about graphite tomorrow in class. Okay, and this is looking in. Okay, it's a network. It's a network. It's a lattice network. Here, we've got a covalent bond between these two, but look, it's in a very fixed pattern. So, graphite is actually very soft. What about the structure, do you think, would make it soft? And it also conducts electricity. Diamond, on the other hand, looks like this. This. Diamond is not soft. Diamond is very, very hard. On most scale of hardness, it's 10. It will not conduct electricity. Quartz. Glass does not conduct electricity. It's an insulator. Um, and at very high melting point and very, very hard. The next type of solid that we're real familiar with at room temperature are ionic solids, salts. Okay, so we know that ionics are held together by Coulombic interactions, meaning that positive, positively charged ions and negatively charged ions attract one another. And this is also an incredibly strong attraction because they are solids at room temperature. We don't encounter gaseous or molten salts. It's not our normal everyday experience. And the reason that it's solid at room temperature is because of the strength of attraction between positively and negatively charged ions. Okay, so they have extremely high melting points, some of them higher than metals. They're brittle in that if you try to break up this matrix, if you pound this matrix, what's going to happen is that, so a negative will come into contact with a negative, and what is the negative and the negative going to do? The negative and the negative is going to repel. The thing's going to be brittle, and it's going to break apart. So you cannot deform a salt. As soon as you break the lattice, like charges are going to come in contact with one another, and it's just going to, it's going to fall apart. It's brittle. Um, now, this kind of solid lattice work has no free electrons. No free electrons at all. So this thing is not going to conduct electricity whatsoever because the electrons are not free to flow. But if we melt a salt or we dissolve it and it becomes an aqueous solution, then the charges are able to flow. They're able to move around and they can set up um, a voltage differential and conduct electricity. Okay, so ionic compounds are held together by strong Coulombic interactions, thus we see them as solids at room temperature because they are so attracted to one another. Last but not least, we have molecular solids. Okay, so these are covalent compounds, so they're sharing electrons, but they are not in a network lattice like diamond, or graphite, or quartz. So what are examples of covalently bonded compounds that we generally encounter in our normal everyday life. 
sugar, sucrose, glucose, fructose, plastics, um, which our world is surrounded with. They're variations on the same theme, and the theme is hydrocarbons. Um, so plastics are generally long chains of hydrocarbons with various other uh, atoms placed in, in and around it. And fats. So there's some fats that are solid at room temperature. Coconut oil is solid at room temperature. Uh, butter is solid at room temperature. So these are examples of molecular solids. Um, we don't have cookware made of plastic because plastic melts. Um, if we've ever made candy, we know that sugars melt on the stove and we definitely know that fats melt. These, one molecule is held to another molecule via intermolecular forces, which are relatively weak, dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding. Ionic are held together by coulombic interactions. Coulombic electrostatic interactions. And last but not least, let's go back to covalent network, and this is, uh, they are held together by um, sharing electrons. Okay, in this very lattice network type of structure. Okay, that's it for solids.